Hello, everyone. I'm Chep Archwinski from the Lean Enterprise Institute. I'm with Jim Womack, our founder of LEI and a senior advisor. We just finished moments ago the uh, webinar on Gemba Walks. And although we ran out of time, we uh, did not run out of questions. We got hundreds, and uh, there were thousands of people on the line. So thanks for joining us. And what we want to do now, we've quickly culled through the uh, questions that people submitted that we didn't get to. And uh, I'm going to pose them now to Jim. And I was just looking for, Jim, some of the, uh, the themes that seem to be uh, top of mind with people. Mm -hmm. And basically, they fall into, let's say, two categories. One, people are looking for uh, some practical details based on mm -hmm. your experience of doing mm -hmm. this for so many mm -hmm. years. And they're also looking for some connections with some other lean tools. Mm -hmm. um, so for instance, with a, uh, uh, a tool-related question uh, is, what is the link between uh, a Gemba walk and visual management, and then how are they integrated one in another? Mm -hmm. Well, when I say Gemba walk, I really am talking about something special. There's daily management, and I hope you have something that you can call standardized management, where every area leader is going to go through the area every day and maybe every hour and whatever is appropriate in terms of a frequency to see how things are doing. And there's, of course, the meeting at the beginning of the day or the end of the day or however. Uh, that, I would say, is just part of standard management. And as you do that, we hope the condition is visible, that you know, are you ahead, are you behind, do you have good quality or not, and all of the other things that are necessary to run a good, robust process. So that's one thing. This is something else. This Gimbal Walk is to periodically take a look at the entire process with fresh eyes involving everyone who's touching it to go from start to finish to decide how you're doing and also how you could do better. So think of one as being daily or hourly or weekly and the other as being um, at whatever interval is appropriate to take fresh eyes, take a good look and see where you need to go next. How, sticking with the, uh, the tools, there's, uh, there was a couple questions about, um, you referenced A3, and people were wondering mm -hmm. the proper use of A3 with uh, mm -hmm. a Gemma mm -hmm. walk mm -hmm. and how they mm -hmm. uh, work together. The way I do this is sort of tool free to get started. Here is a situation in an organization where there's not much process consciousness process flows across the organization. Uh, each part of the organization is a slice, and they may have some consciousness of what's happening with their little slice. But no one has much consciousness of what's happening to the whole. So the point here is let's take a walk and go look at the whole. To do that, uh, you're not going to do an A3 while you're walking. And by the way, you're not going to do a value stream map while you're walking. What you're going to do uh, is have done enough uh, pre-work that somebody surely at least knows what the steps in the process are, although sometimes you find out they don't. Let's start at the beginning. What's going on here? What are the problems? What's going on here? What are the problems? What's going on here? And then you get to the end, and then you can really have a good discussion and ask some pretty simple questions. Does anybody have responsibility for this process? The answer is typically no. Uh, does anybody know who designed this process? Almost invariably the answer is no because it wasn't designed, it happened. Does anybody have a plan for improving, not a point, but the whole? And the answer usually is, well, no. So then you've got the basis for going further. And to go further, you're going to need probably to create uh, a more uh, sophisticated way to see. I mean, this is, a, I think, a great way to see with everybody there present and able to talk. but. We need to turn that into something that uh, can be referenced from time to time, and we typically call that a map, something that can be shared, uh, something that can go on a wall where everybody can see it. And then that map needs to be in the context of an A3, because what A3 does, uh, first off, we begin with uh, trying to grasp the situation. What's the current condition and what's the issue? And then we go from that into well, what's the problem or what's the gap? And then from that, we go into, well, OK, now we need a detailed process map and analysis to understand what's causing the gap. And then once we begin to see that, well, then we say, gosh, what countermeasures could we apply? And we have to prioritize. 
And then which one are we going to try and how are we going to do this in an experimental, robust, rigorous way? And then finally, who is going to do what, when to run this experiment? And then how are we going to incorporate the experimental learnings into day-to-day -day and continuing ongoing management? So, uh, Gimba Walk is a consciousness-raising activity. It's a way to get a very important conversation started. It's not a technical analysis, but it leads often to a technical analysis, and that's where you have A3 and VSM, value stream mapping, as the things to carry it forward. I'm glad you brought up that point about um, uh, problem solving and analysis, because there were a couple of questions people were asking, uh, for instance, this sounds like problem solving. Is the Gimbal mm -hmm. Walk really the right place to do root cause analysis? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, how do you get data available for this? Uh, mm -hmm. What do you do when right. you face a hard problem during a Gimbal mm -hmm. Walk? Mm -hmm. And obviously this mm -hmm. is, as you said, consciousness raising. Yeah. This is this yeah. the, the, the tough problem solving and mm -hmm. data analysis comes mm -hmm. afterwards. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, I do this all the time, so I'm used to it, but I'm always uh, careful not to identify uh, any organization. I'm asked in as a visitor, I try to show respect. I don't think I show respect by uh, saying uh, what will sound like negative things about organizations in public. Uh, I don't mean them negatively, they're just factual, here's what's going on. But uh, recently, and when I say recently, in the last month I've probably done ten walks. Um, the, the most important thing that happened was that the senior managers were maneuvered into coming along in a big organization to look at a process that cut across the organization. And it was apparent as we started that these people had a hard time talking with each other outside of a conference room where everybody had their PowerPoint and everyone was explaining how they were meeting their metrics or if they weren't was coming up with a good reason. And it did seem like the most important thing to do was to have an explanation of why you weren't meeting your metrics. And what we're trying to do is change that, which is a vertical conversation, looking up, to a, not just a sideways conversation, but a shared conversation by going together to look at what was actually being done at the working level. And this was highly enlightening, because in this case it turned out about half, and you could see this actually quite easily, about half of the work, this was an office process, that they were doing was rework. Dropped handoffs, turned backs, reworks, workarounds. And people were happy to share, once we made it clear this was an amnesty time, the people doing the work were happy to share the workarounds. And just say matter of factly, well here's the standard operating procedure, but nobody could do it that way because it doesn't work. So here's what we've done instead. So what we end up with is this big pile of band-aids. And this was something that was just not in the consciousness of the higher level folks who should, uh, as a key element in their activity, have process consciousness. So just raising the fact that it's all connected, and if you do something here, it has an effect over here, shouldn't we think about that? And by the way, the people over here who've never actually talked to the people over here really ought to talk to each other. And then that creates all kinds of issues that only senior management can then address, but now we're on our way to actually addressing it. You mentioned about uh, showing respect, and uh, I think this uh, connects well with that because we had, we had a question um, during the webinar about uh, senior management's role, and you talked about that, and also there, there was a question about operators. How do you not mm -hmm. in yeah. intimidate operators? Mm -hmm. And now someone is, is asking about overcoming, mm -hmm. well, it's about uh, mm -hmm. first-line supervisors. Mm -hmm. um, how do you overcome the perception of micromanagement mm -hmm. uh, to a first-line mm -hmm. supervisor? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. in, in your experience, and I, mm -hmm. I suspect with the, uh, mm -hmm. the same answer applies that you, you emphasize mm -hmm. when you go there mm -hmm. that you're looking mm -hmm. at the work, not the, mm -hmm. not, not the Yeah, individual. but also, um, we're here to understand how the work is organized and how people do it. And we need to hear from the people who do the work about how they think things are being done. Uh, this is not about frontline management. It's not about individual workers. This is about a shared collective activity. Um, people desperately want to tell you about their issues. They absolutely do. If you can just create a situation where it's safe for people to say, well, you know, what's really going on here is X. Uh, at a lovely uh, situation recently, walking through a, an operation, and one of the workers, a very energetic young man, 
had discovered that they had a tremendous amount of rework at the end of the line that was actually occurring way up the line. So on his own doing, he had built a extra inspection station in on the back side of the line without really asking. He just did it. And at first he didn't want to talk about it. And so then I said, but gee, what's this? And by the way, I'm always looking for the thing that no one wants to, to talk about or, or look at. So well, what's this? And th this was really interesting. That here was a very energetic young person trying to do the right thing and had in fact altered the process in an organization that in his view had no real ability to talk about this on his own initiative to make it better. And of course once I spotted it, well he was terrified that uh, this, you know, the, the axe would fall. But I'm right there with the big bosses and say, well, look guys, um, what does this tell you about your organization? That good people working hard have no actual way to improve the work. And here is the person doing a wonderful thing which is trying to improve the work without a context for improving the work. Well, I think that everybody was there. All the big bosses were there. And they're saying, oh my gosh, uh, look what's happening here. Never looked at this. Never thought about it. So therefore, uh, hey look, uh, sure, I'm there, I'm an outsider. I'm this guy that some people have heard of. So here's, uh, here's old Womack. And so maybe the rules get relaxed and so forth. But I think senior management can do this by setting a tone. Let's go together and take a look at how we work. And this is not about anybody. This is about us collectively. It's not about anybody individually. And let's just talk. Because in fact, um, we know there are problems. So why don't we quit saying there aren't problems. Let's say there are problems. So now what are the issues? But this is not telling some production supervisor, hey, here's how you should do your work better. This is not telling some worker, hey, you know, put it in this way rather than this way. It's not about that at all. It's just trying to look at the process. Uh, I, I mentioned in the webinar that I spend a lot of time what I, uh, thinking about what I call the social process, which is how are people trained to do the job? How are they supported when they try to do the job? How can they improve their work? And you're right there. And you ask people, you say, gee, you know, how do you improve your work? And the answer is, well, you know, we had a Kaizen about three months ago, although we never really finished it. They say, aha. Well, it sounds like you can't improve the work because there's no context for improving the work. And then I look around everybody else and say, is that right? Mm -hmm. oh, oh, yeah, well. So um, the, the idea is to get to a real discussion about the real issues, which I guarantee is not about individual people and it's not about individual micro steps. Uh, it's about the process as a total process and it's about how management supports it. The five whys, not the five whos. Yeah, exactly. Right. No whos, no whos. No whos. No Only whys, please, no whos. Um, a quick question. You talked about also the, uh, uh, during the webinar that um, uh, most organiz organizations are organized vertically. Mm -hmm. The Gimbal Walk is, is giving people a horizontal view. Mm -hmm. um, do the verticals have any, um, any value? Are they, oh, are they in, in value, they're indispensable. Uh, when I was younger, uh, let me make a confession. Uh, 20 years ago, when I first started looking outside of the car industry, when we were working on the Lean Thinking book, and I say we, that's Dan Jones and Jim Womack, um, I really hoped that you could turn organizations sideways and you could turn each product family value stream, if you will, into a company. Uh -huh. Would that be nice? So it could have its own engineering, and its own sales, and its own marketing, and its own production, and its own purchasing, and so forth. Interesting idea. And there are a few companies where you could actually do that. A couple of those companies were actually in the Lean Thinking book. And they weren't chosen to be special cases. I didn't know at the time, but they really were special cases. And as time has gone on, and I've seen more, you know, I do learn, um, I've concluded that there are actually very few organizations where you can do that. That there's a real reason that all your engineers need to be able to talk to each other. There's a real reason why production people need to be able to talk to each other across multiple product families. Engineers across multiple product lines. Purchasing across multiple product lines. So it would be great if you could just get rid of the verticals and have everything running horizontal. I don't think we can do that. And then the second idea that came up, not mine, and I never believed a word of this, but that, well, let's have a matrix. 
in which you have the horizontal boss and the vertical boss. And then here you are trying to work where they meet, vertical and horizontal, saying, hmm, who's the boss? Woof, the answer on that one is, uh, this is not good. Yeah, That's the right. answer, this is not good. So, how can we get beyond that? And where I am now, and I reserve the right to uh, continue to think and observe, and to watch other people's experiments, uh, is that it's actually possible to make someone responsible for the whole process to find a way to portray how it's actually working and what the problems really are. And by the way, the problems are all between these vertical activities. To get a discussion started about, well, how can we do the right thing for the horizontal, which is what the customer is concerned about, right? And it's that kind of discussion that just doesn't happen. And what I find that uh, as companies are having trouble, that the senior managers uh, impose more and more metrics on the verticals. What they need is a bigger scoreboard, a bigger dashboard, more metrics, more data analysis. And to me, it's just digging a deeper and deeper hole because there's no alignment between these things. And you will often see uh, people running an operation where all of the metrics are, in fact, either point metrics that the only way to do well is by messing up everything else, or else they're system metrics over which the point actually has no, no control. So, you know, this is crazy. You can't have a metric for something that's not even yours to, to manage. And then if you have irrelevant or destructive point metrics that cause everybody else to do worse while this one vertical does better, well, what have you achieved? Uh, and then the, then the normal answer is, well, what we need is even more metrics. Okay, so, uh, good luck. Uh, just a, uh, a couple uh, questions left. The, um, what happens at the end, in your experience, what happens at the end of a, a, a gimbal walk? Mm -hmm. what, wh what's mm -hmm. the reaction? Mm -hmm. And also, um, mm -hmm. I know you've, you've been to s some places many times. Mm -hmm. um, has the gimbal walk spurred um, a change in thinking and behavior that mm -hmm. uh, people have been able to uh, well, sustain? Well, don't forget that I get uh, to go places only by invitation. I don't uh, have a battering ram, I don't have a SWAT team, you know, the helicopter that lands on the roof and I come down to the, the, the skylight. Um, people only call, call me because they're thinking that maybe they ought to try something different, right? So that there's a disposition to try something if anybody calls, okay? And that's good. Uh, that doesn't mean that they're actually gonna be able to do something. And I don't have any batting average to, to give you. And also I've learned over time that you go to see somebody and you do a walk and you get everybody suddenly for the first time to have a conversation about this, it could be nothing happens for a while. And you think, well, gee, you know, what a shame they can never really do anything. And then about a year later, uh, somebody calls you and says, you know, we had to think about it for a while, but then we said, well, why don't we try this experiment? And they said, would you like to come back? Because I think we've actually done something. So that's enormously gratifying, but by the way, I don't need to come back. If they've had a shift in consciousness and they're now able to think both horizontally and vertically rather than just vertically, they don't need me. Uh, that's, that's not, uh, you know, look, I'm just catalytic. Uh, I'm not uh, anything that you believe me that you need. And that, by the way, that's why I'm not a consultant. Um, I don't like to go back, but I do like to hear. And I say, hey, let's keep in touch. Always tell people, if you'll do something brilliant, I'll put you in the next book. And some people call me and say they've done something brilliant, and then I do go back, and sometimes they've done something brilliant, and sometimes they've just done something. Um, but that's okay. So a little bit by little bit, uh, people do move along. But I'm not a good sample because uh, people don't call unless they've got some serious thought going on about how they could uh, change their, their mindset and change their, elevate their consciousness. So uh, happy to go when that happens. Final question. Um, you're out there a lot, you've seen a lot of lean implementations. Um, what's the state of lean? Um, where do we go from here? Um, well, first off, I still always get the question, what comes after lean? And the answer is, well, nothing. Because all this is about is about how people work together collaboratively to try to create more value and, and correct perfect value with less and less and less. That's all it's about. And so this is a long, long human story that we're involved in that goes back at least 500 years of people systematically thinking about that. And there are points along the way in the Venetian arsenal, and maybe it was the Chinese and the treasure ships before that, and then it was Henry Ford, and then it was uh, Toyota, and so forth. 
Uh, at each point, uh, some new methods that worked better were learned, and we move on. So uh, there's no endpoint to this. Uh, we happen to give it a label for this time, which is lean. Uh, you can use that or not. Uh, I really don't care. Um, so number one, this doesn't end because the problem doesn't go away. And the problem is that the world always needs more value, and the waste is getting in the way of the value. Mm -hmm. So that the fundamental problem doesn't go away. How can we work together more effectively to create value? Um, I, I always tell people I'm a short-term optimist, uh, pessimist, sorry, excuse me, I'm a short-term pessimist, but a long-term optimist. Uh, I've been out walking around looking at companies for 35 years. And during that time, it's been an amazing change in how effective organizations can be. That the kind of quality that we now just absolutely take for a given, uh, 35 years ago, practically no organization could meet. That uh, when I first started doing this uh, 35 years ago in the factory world, everything was process village. You had these enormous inventories everywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, throughput times were very long. Uh, you just don't go see uh, factories these days in the, you know, the developed countries that have the kind of stuff sitting around that you saw 30 or 35 years ago. Now, if they got everything lined up in process sequence and they're flowing straight through and they've got 100 inventory turns rather than three, well, no. But do they have eight rather than three, or 10 rather than three? In an awful lot of places, the answer is yes. So I would say that we're making steady progress, that it's not in a straight line. And by the way, it's not just in a straight line sort of collectively for all of society, but for organizations. I wish they could just improve in a straight line, but things happen, the world, the world trips them up, uh, they lose the key leader they had who was doing it and have to wait for somebody else, and so forth. But in general, the trend is positive. So therefore, I continue to be, I'm not going to give up on this, a long-term optimist. Oddly, um, the more pain you're feeling in the short term, the more progress we make in the long term. Just talking to a healthcare audience uh, yesterday, uh, day before, and just saying this is a wonderful time because the pain is just going up to a completely unbearable level in healthcare to a point where everybody is now saying the future cannot be like the past. And we got to get the value proposition adjusted because yeah. we got too much cost for the value we're creating. I did not hear that 10 years ago. I didn't hear it 20 years ago. I didn't hear it 30 years ago. Now, I don't find anybody who doesn't want to start the conversation by telling me how much pain they're in mm -hmm. and how they got to do something. So now the question is just what are we going to do? So pain's good. I hate to say it. Short-term misery uh, is good for long-term happiness. If, of course, you do something and you don't just stand there and get hit by the train. Yeah, that's so um, that's, uh, that's the, the key step. Don't get hit by the train. Well, uh, we're about out of time again, mm -hmm. uh, but we've still got a lot more questions. So that means a lot more homework. Mm -hmm. But um, I just want to tell the viewers that uh, thanks for being here once again. Mm -hmm. uh, and go to uh, lean.org right slash Womack. We're going to post the uh, answers to... Uh, uh, these questions we couldn't get to. Jim's right. going to be noodling away, working hard, beavering away oh. to uh, oh. finish the, uh, the questions. So once again, uh, thanks for attending. And for, on behalf of Jim and everyone here at LEI, we wish you continued success in making your lean leap.